coverage of the showdown between Russia and Ukraine, where nuance is missing in action. The Israeli government reboots a failed program aimed at changing the narrative on its treatment of Palestinians. And Hollywood's take on the climate change story. The entire planet is about to be destroyed. The explicit critique of journalism in Don't Look Up. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we examine the media and look at how news is reported. In the coverage of bilateral conflicts, like the one between Russia and Ukraine, there is a journalistic tendency, the taking of sides. Ask reporters from Ukraine or its Western allies who they see as the villain, and most will point to Russia and Vladimir Putin's imperialist ambitions. Put that question to journalists in Moscow, and they'll give you a history lesson on NATO its aggressive expansion to the East. Add some complex history, sprinkle in some disinformation, mainly from the Russian side, and it leaves audiences wherever they are, short of the full story. The fact is, there are currently more than 100,000 Russian troops stationed on or close to the Ukrainian border. The fact also is that the Kremlin has been waging a hybrid war in Ukraine since 2014, part military threat, part information warfare. We're focusing on the information war, which means our starting point is Moscow. Tensions between Russia and the West are growing rapidly. Starting with an argument that's coming out of Moscow these days on the role the media play in the Ukraine story, an equivalence that's as false as they come. It's one you'll sometimes hear from journalists employed at Russian state-owned news channels like RT. Most Russian media outlets echo the Kremlin's line on Ukraine, but then again, most Western media outlets echo the White House's line on Ukraine. In Russia, it's not only the state media that kind of runs the line, it's also the private media that's not controlled by the Kremlin, and it's the same in the West. I mean, the BBC toes the British government line, and the Times or the Telegraph, which are notionally independent, they do the very same thing. No, they do not. Western media outlets are prone to echoing some of their government's positions on geopolitical conflicts. But they're also free to present contrary opinions and to speak truth to power. Don't believe it? Just search Joe Biden, legislative record, or Boris Johnson, lockdown parties. Try that kind of journalism in Russia, on Vladimir Putin, and you're liable to be branded a foreign agent. Have your news channel taken off the air or, like dissident Alexei Navalny, get thrown into prison. There is no equivalence. Which is not to say that when it comes to the history of Russia, Ukraine, and NATO, the Russians don't have some legitimate points to make. One has always to ask, where does this story begin? And for the Russians, it goes back to the 1990s and the diplomacy that ended the Cold War which the West took advantage of. There's also an element of truth to the story that they're telling, and there is a way in which the Western media just simply conveniently forgets the complexities of the situation in Ukraine. And it's undeniable that from the 90s onwards, NATO set its uh, sails towards expansion, and that has left Moscow uneasy ever since. And whenever any government in Kiev makes a step towards the West, the alarm bells go off in Moscow. This is also one of Russia's narrative about NATO Eastern expansion. Russia has been clinging for years to false information that Gorbachev was promised that if the Soviet bloc disbanded, NATO would not expand East. So now we know that was quite a myth and actually not true. But uh, Rus Russian officials uh, cling to this and repeat that myth to this day. The situation is quite clear. The bad guy in this situation is Russia, because Ukraine is an independent state which lives its own life. It doesn't attack anyone, it doesn't bother anyone. While Russia is creating a constant threat near our border. We are simply unlucky with a neighbor who is constantly claiming its rights over our territory, our future, our lives. Let me put it this way, when there are two parties, the truth does not always lie in the middle. Sometimes one party may completely mislead. Or one side can disinform. In this so-called hybrid war, Kiev is outgunned on both fronts. It cannot match Moscow's military strength. 
the more than 100,000 Russian troops gathered on or near the border. And it cannot compete in the information war. Not with the tools the Kremlin has at its disposal. With disinformation disseminated on Russian news channels and on social media. Last year, the government in Kiev removed three pro-Russian news channels owned by a local businessman from the Ukrainian airwaves. And it set up government departments to combat disinformation online. But this information war is a mismatch. After these TV channels were, were blocked, Russia is relying more on social media once again. This includes Facebook, but also most uh, importantly Telegram Messenger, which is an important source of information in Ukraine. Last year, Ukraine Security Service published proof that Russia is behind a network of anonymous Telegram channels with around 500,000 subscribers. And this information often has nothing to do with reality. It just reflects what uh, Russian intelligence uh, wants Ukrainians to believe in. There are also troll factories and so-called bots spreading fake news, claiming that the US is to blame and that they want to threaten Russia via Ukraine. The idea is that Russia is under attack and it is only protecting itself. One of the platforms where Russian disinformation is being spread in Ukraine is YouTube. We still fail to understand why its algorithm allows this to happen. This disinformation system is big. It encompasses different spheres and the media is just one part of that ecosystem. The primary platform broadcasting pro-Russian talking points in Ukraine is Nash TV, owned by a political player there, Yevhen Murayev. Murayev's name came up in a UK intelligence report that was recently leaked, perhaps strategically, to the British media. That report alleged Russia was planning an invasion and a coup, that the Kremlin also planned to install Murayev to lead a pro-Russian puppet regime in Kiev. He would be an odd choice, given the authorities in Moscow have slapped Murayev with sanctions and won't even let him into Russia. There's only really two theories in my mind. The first theory is that the British intelligence are just so bad at this stage that they don't actually do any spying at all, and all they do is propaganda, you know. And the second, and, and that their Ukraine expertise is so weak that they just pick this random guy without checking, fact-checking at all. Or is the Russians perhaps planted this with the British intelligence for a laugh, just to make them look stupid. It's very possible. It is not very realistic, but it, it is definitely possible, because if we take a look at Russia's playbook, in 2014, when Russia took over Crimea, it established Sergei Aksyonov as the so-called Prime Minister of Crimea. Russia. Russia. And Aksyonov was a really uh, not very popular regional politician, so the same scenario could be in works for uh, Ukraine government with Morale. NATO is a military alliance whose members aren't always on the same page politically. That is evident in the headlines being generated on this conflict in the US compared to more diplomatic noises coming out of European countries like Germany. Because while NATO has expanded to the east, Russian influence has expanded to the west. Many NATO countries in Europe have grown dependent on Russian energy exports to heat their homes, drive their industries. Faced with the prospect of being cut off midwinter, some of the Cold War rhetoric that used to come out of those governments has melted away which does not bode well for Ukraine. You can see why a one-sided narrative emerges here. It's Russia that has 110,000 troops. It's Russia that has the Air Force. But ask, why are we here? The question becomes much more complex. It's because the rest of the world buys Russia's oil, buys Russian gas. That's what's created the power which Putin is harnessing. Right? That is a reality that the Europeans in particular have to face, because 40% of their gas that they import comes from Russia. This is a situation where we're in fact much more dependent on each other than we were in the period of maximum tension in the Cold War. 
That's why it's up to everyone to decide whether the world will remain a safe place or if it will be guided by so-called other interests. As for a counter-propaganda system, an apparatus like the Russian propaganda machine, we don't have it here in Ukraine. Russia is constantly trying to bring Ukraine back into the orbit of its influence. Ukraine doesn't want to return to that. And that is the choice of the majority of the Ukrainian people. The last time the Israeli government tried it, it failed. But it's taking another shot at funding an organization designed to push back globally against bad PR. Minakshi Ravi's here with the details. That's right, Richard. The Israeli government has signed off on spending 100 million shekels, that's over $30 million over the next four years, to fund CONCERT, an initiative to, quote, fight the phenomenon of delegitimization against the state of Israel and build civil legitimacy in the world. There's been a rising tide of damaging headlines and critical news coverage of Israel. The efforts of BDS, the Palestinian-led boycott, divest and sanctions movement, to spotlight state-orchestrated crimes have been effective in shifting Western public opinion the Palestinians' way. That sounds like a stated strategy to remove Palestinians from East Jerusalem. To make There's also been a steady stream of negative news reports on violence and abuse by the Israeli army and the cyber tech company NSO that created the surveillance malware Pegasus that's been used against rights activists, journalists and dissidents in many countries. The government of Naftali Bennett wants to push back against all that and the plan is to have influencers, activists and organizations from around the world, especially from the United States, recruited by concert to counter the narrative and push state-approved messages across media outlets and social networks. The idea isn't entirely new. It's the second attempt at running a joint public-private venture to try what Israel calls consciousness shaping. And the funding from the government is just half of what's needed. Matching funds, another $30 million, are to be raised through donations from private individuals and civil society. That private participation is important. Concert requires it so that it can be classified as a non-governmental body. Otherwise, under U.S. law, the influencers concert recruits would be declared as foreign agents, that is, agents on the payroll of the Israeli government. The last time this project was attempted, civil society groups in Israel called it essentially anti-democratic. It also flopped because of a lack of private donations. So we'll be keeping an eye on this. We'll be following the money. Thanks, Mina. Don't Look Up is a movie about the climate crisis that somehow does a more effective job of highlighting the problem than most news outlets do. The film's producers had an allegorical approach. They took the ecological breakdown and transformed it into a comet on a collision course with planet Earth. The early streaming numbers make Don't Look Up the second most successful film Netflix has ever made. But it's getting better reviews from scientists than from film critics, perhaps in part because at the film's core is a critique of the fourth estate, news outlets that have failed their audiences on an existential story. David Sirota is a journalist and political activist who co-produced the film. We'll hear from him shortly. But first, a scene from Don't Look Up and the set of a morning news show that is fictional yet somehow familiar. Congratulations. It's somewhere between six and nine kilometers across, so it, it's big. It would damage the the entire planet, not just a house. You know, the entire planet. Okay. Well, as it's damaging, will it hit this one house in particular that's right on the coast of New Jersey? It's my ex-wife's house. I needed to be hit. Can Come we on. make Sorry, that? Happen? Are, we, uh, are we not being clear? We're trying to tell you that the entire planet is about to be destroyed. Okay. okay. Um, well, it's, um, you know, just something we do around here. You know, we just keep the bad news light. David Sirota, welcome to The Listening Post. A critique of the mainstream media, just keeping it light, runs more or less throughout Don't Look Up. But from what I understand, that's kind of where the film got its start. So walk us through how the idea for Don't Look Up came about. Sure, I was uh, talking to Adam McKay, the filmmaker director uh, of the movie, uh, after he had made the movie Vice. Uh, and I said to him, you know, you really got to use your superpowers of filmmaking and comedy to do something about the climate crisis. And he said, yeah, you know, I've been, 
having trouble figuring out how to tackle that issue in a way that's not a kind of Mad Max, post-apocalyptic, dystopian, uh, kind of dark movie. He and I were lamenting about uh, how the media doesn't really cover the climate crisis uh, in a way that's uh, adequate. And at one point I said, you know, it kind of feels like there's an asteroid headed towards Earth and nobody really cares. And he said, you know, maybe that's the movie. And of course, what you stumble on when you game that out is scientists who might have a difficult time getting the message out, getting the science out, getting the facts out uh, inside of a media world that isn't necessarily all that interested in verifiable scientific facts. News outlets and consumers devour stories that move quickly. The problem with climate change is it does not. Don't Look Up deals with that by effectively creating an allegory, hitting fast forward, turning climate change into a speeding comet. But journalists don't have that luxury. So what can they do? Well, I think, first of all, I think climate change is accelerating in, in, a, very, in a very profound and terrifying way. So I think, actually, unfortunately, it's becoming easier and easier to, uh, to cover because the effects are so intense. Um, I also think uh, that climate isn't just about droughts, floods, uh, and the like. Uh, climate change is going to be about really everything. I mean, here's the thing. The news media puts the economy at the center of its coverage. The economy is not a story. Uh, the economy is part of every story. So part of what we're talking about here is that climate has to become part of the way we tell stories in our world because it is part of the fabric of news uh, throughout the world. Part of Don't Look Up's appeal is that you've taken a serious subject, but the film is a comedy. Is part of the difficulty that news outlets have in engaging news audiences on the climate crisis is that the news is often so depressing. Some kinds of climate coverage can make everything feel hopeless, uh, and that it's just a story of gloom and doom, and there's nothing uh, really that an audience can do. Rolling Stone just published this incredibly frightening piece titled, The Fuse Has Been Blown and the Doomsday Glacier is Coming for Us All, which, yikes. What we need to hear also is about the efforts to stop the crisis or at least mitigate it. In a lot of ways, the, those, are, those can be compelling stories because in, in many of the stories, it's the classic story uh, of good versus evil, private interest versus the public interest. So I, I don't think there's a shortage of ways to tell compelling stories uh, about this crisis. I think there is a, a potentially a shortage of vision, of imagination in a news media that has gotten used to telling stories one way and no other way. A few years back we spoke with a climate specialist. He told us that he doesn't think governments are the primary obstacles in dealing with climate change. He thinks news outlets are. You've worked on both sides of that street, so how do you see it? Oh boy, uh, that's a good question. Uh, look, I, I, think, I, I think there's not one factor here in why we haven't acted on climate. We live in a society where the way we think about an issue like climate is disproportionately dictated by whether it's political leadership or large corporate media outlets that have deep ties to the industries that are creating the crisis. Whether it is the fossil fuel industry buying politicians or the fossil fuel industry spending a huge amount of money on advertising that essentially bankrolls major corporate media outlets, that is creating a framework for the way we talk about climate change that essentially has a thumb on the scale, the fossil fuel thumb on the scale. And I think what we need to do as human beings is realize that we're going to need to actually make real changes uh, in our energy system, in our food system, in our environmental policies, and that when, when politicians or uh, media elites say that making those changes is unrealistic or they eye roll or they sigh. Those are the people who are the problem. Your film has been such a hit with audiences, but a lot of the reviews in the mainstream news media have been quite negative. Now you took a run at the media in Don't Look Up. Do you think this is a case of sour grapes? Were you surprised at all? That didn't, that didn't surprise me at all. Uh, and it didn't surprise me because 
Look, this is a movie about political issues. And when you make something as big as this movie is, on as big a platform as it is, uh, you're gonna get a, a passionate response. Uh, some people are not gonna wanna hear the message. I will also say that I think uh, in the political space, uh, some very powerful people have watched this movie and probably it makes them uncomfortable. You cannot go around saying to people that there's a 100% chance that they're gonna die. You know, it's just nuts. This is a movie that is attempting to say to millions, uh, hundreds of millions, of regular people in the world uh, that we have a serious problem that the people at the top are creating. Having been preoccupied with climate change, first as a journalist, then having co-produced a film about it, do you emerge from this process more or less hopeful about the future of the planet? I mean, look, there have been times since this movie came out that I have felt pretty down, that in some ways I felt like in the highest regions of the media uh, and politics, that this movie has prompted people to performatively behave as if they are in the movie itself. In other words, that the movie has held up a mirror to uh, political and media elites uh, and hasn't necessarily prompted uh, a, a reevaluation or new behaviors or even contemplation. Then again, uh, the huge audience response to the movie is entirely inspiring, clearly there is a demand for us to start talking about real truths. Uh, and there's that scene in the movie that I think about a lot. It's in that rant with, with Leonardo DiCaprio, and he says, what have we done to ourselves? How do we fix it? We should have deflected this comment when we had the f chance, but we didn't do it. And to me, that's a very hopeful message, because this movie isn't prophecy or destiny, it's cautionary. And you have a character in the movie basically saying, there is a way for us to have dealt with this. And so my hope is that this is not a flash in the pan, that the success of this movie will actually be a longer lasting legacy that provides opportunities for more climate coverage in the media uh, and provides uh, more of a, uh, a critical thinking process among millions and millions of people in how they demand real action from their governments and from their communities. David Sirota, congratulations for making a Hollywood film that succeeds where mainstream media so often fails. And thanks for speaking to us here at The Listening Post today. Thank you, thanks for having me. And finally, it's one of the most underreported conflicts of the past decade, the war in Yemen. It pops up in the headlines whenever there are new airstrikes, as there have been in the past week or so. But this seven-year-old war gets nowhere near the media coverage it deserves. So we're closing our program this week with recommendations of outlets and resources that are covering Yemen. These are places we turn to to get more than just the blow-by-blow -blow on the war. Starting with Twitter, some of the people we follow are Afra Nasser at Human Rights Watch and Fatima Al-Asrar of the DC-based Middle East Institute. Salah Al-Batati is a Yemeni journalist we track. Then there's the Yemen Policy Center, a think tank created by Yemeni and German researchers. Some of its funding comes from the German government. Beyond policy reports and research documents, this site combines factual reporting with the kind of storytelling usually reserved for fiction writing, glimpses into life in the country. An affiliate of the YPC is Al Madaniya magazine. It publishes in Arabic and English. Many writers, artists and poets who would not have a platform elsewhere find space on Al Madaniya's site. The focus on Yemeni culture, literature, and civil society makes this outlet one of a kind. Finally, on our recommendation list is the Sanaa Center. Its website is not the slickest, but if you're looking to understand Yemen, then the articles there, the YouTube archive, and the podcast produced by the Yemen Peace Forum are all worth looking through. We'll be keeping an eye on media stories coming out of Yemen as well, and we'll see you next time here at The Listening Post.